Um, I want you to uh, recognize a couple of things, two or three things. One is we um, stimulate the sea urchins to release either the sperm or the egg with the potassium chloride. Okay. Um, this is the mouth or the gastropore, and the gonadopore is actually on the opposite side. So if it's releasing the eggs, those are set on top of a beaker. And if it's releasing sperm, they have this, you can tell how it comes out. It's like, then they're put on a, a petri dish with a little bit of seawater. So most of you were able to see a fertilized egg. This, I want to make sure you know what the fertilization uh, ring looks like. And don't interpret this a little bit as the fertilization ring. So it's this outer structure here, so the cell membrane or the fertilization uh, ring, and that's the equivalent of a human zona pellucida. So that gives the zona undergo block fast and slow block stuff, blocks the polyspermy as well. All right, so you can see one of the nuclei down here, um, and I don't see any of uh, the second uh, dairy uh, cell divisions, but here you can see both, uh, both pronuclei, which one is male, which is one is female, I can't tell not uh, showing any Xers or Ys, but um, as they come to close, when they come together and the chromosomes have lined up as a, the new first time they undergo mitosis, so when the pronuclei are separate, it's still male sperm DNA and the um, oocyte or ovum, those mean the same thing. So they, the DNA from both male and female have to come together and randomly mix to line up that metaphase before we can call it a zygote, okay? So this is actual fertilization of a human uh, secondary oocyte. There's the first polar body. So these would each be two parentheses in um, our first haploid cell, but we have two copies of each of the chromosomes. Uh, so it's haploid with two parentheses in. This is creating a little bit of suction, holding the oocyte, well, the zona pellucida, so that it can be penetrated and the sperm is, you might be able to see a little black dot just a bit before the um, pipette pre penetrates that. And um, the first time this occurred, it was, they weren't on uh, mitosis. Obviously the egg was being fertilized, but they thought that all of the um, sperm binding to the acrosome and then binding to, I mean, the, the zona pellucida and then binding to the plasma membrane of the egg would be required to trigger that next meiotic division, that second meiotic division, and lo and behold, it was just the penetration by the pipette that did. And it went on to um, undergo the mitotic cell division. They didn't, they weren't planning, they didn't have any female reproductive tract to put it into, it wasn't the plan, but this is now what they do. Um, and it's successful about 50% of the time, maybe a little bit more now, where they, the sperm can't swim to the egg. Normally, in in vitro fertilization, they put in um, a bunch of sperm with the egg in a petri dish, and in that solution is progesterone and other chemicals that are necessary for the sperm to undergo capacitation. Here it doesn't need capacitation because it's not penetrating the egg on its own. It doesn't need to have the heavy tail beating and the head wagging, and it doesn't have, they're trying to genetically select, maybe there's a genetic problem and they want to screen um, for certain chromosomes in or out, you know, do that one sperm. All right, so this is a secondary oocyte. And there were, the other we had in the quiz is the corona radiata, all right? And this white band is the zona pellucida, and then the entire yellow is the secondary oocyte. And so that would be four would be the nucleus, which is the two parentheses in nuclei. You're not seeing the polar body here, okay? That's the first model that I have in mind over there on the countertop. All right, here's the tail, little piece of string of the spermatozoa that got lucky. And here's the nucleus of the um, second, this is still a secondary oocyte, all right, because we hasn't undergone cell division yet, so it would be triggered by the penetration here. And so this would be a two parentheses in nucleus cell, so this is still a secondary oocyte. All right, male uh, pronucleus, female pro pronucleus is usually near the polar body. And in the models that we have here, the first polar body has undergone the second meiotic division as well. Okay. Um, that usually doesn't happen, but in this case here, they, they showed that. So this is still a secondary oocyte with the male um, in chromosomal material because they haven't merged yet to join the nuclear material. All right, they're getting close here. Microtubules are forming with, uh, between the chromosomes. 
And so here the first polar body has divided, and this is the second polar body, which would all of them would now be in. Okay, because the first polar body is equal in chromosome pattern two parentheses n to the secondary oocyte. So if it divides, the two parentheses n becomes n in each polar body. And then when the um, secondary oocyte divides and forms the second polar body, each of those is also n. So the oocyte, and if we have three polar bodies, are equivalent to four spermatids that would form from one spermatogonia. Typically, though, that first polar body that is the two divides. Notice they're all still within the zona pellucida. Okay, and that's gonna stay until all the cells reach the uh, urine cavity. The zona pellucida is not shown here, but it would be present. So it's gonna be confusing because people don't see it. The models they take it off. So when the cells divide, they have to get smaller and smaller because they're not getting any nourishment. They're still within the zona pellucida. It doesn't expand. So when the cell divides, it's getting a smaller share of the cytoplasm that the OH had originally had. The solid ball is the moila, and um, then as it continues to divide, it hollows out. And so we start to differentiate within these cells which of those chromosomes are gonna be expressed and make certain proteins. So these cells are closest to the zona pellucida. Cells that are in the middle are farther away, so they have a graduation and exposure to different levels of chemicals, concentrations of hormones proteins that are in the oviduct. All right, so then when it hollows out, it's called the blastula or blastocyst, and all these blue cells at this point are the trophoblast cells. They have the same chroma, they're all diploid cells. Remember, we only talk about two parentheses two in or two parentheses in or in when we have the o um, primary oocyte or primary spermatocyte, the spermatid or oocyte. Okay, anything else, including the zygote, or a trophoblast cell, or an interstitial cell, or a theca internus cell is going to be a regular diploid 2N, full 2N cell, okay? All right, so these trophoblast cells have the same chromosome as the muscle cells on the top of whoever this, become, this person becomes. Same thing in the neurons, it's just not all of those genes are expressed, so we see cells that look different and have different functions. The yellow cells here are the inner cell mass, and we'll look at that a little bit more when we look at um, the developing placenta. So here is the hatching of the blastula, where the zona pellucida ruptures, okay? And here's the inner cell mass, and then the trophoblast cells would be found, sorry, inner cell mass is here. Trophoblast cells would be found, this is still hollow, all around here. Um, Really cool thing, one of the students from the Monday, Wednesday class, um, I think it was Monday, Wednesday. I think it was Monday. Here's the diagram, you can see all the green structures here um, came from the trophoblast and they're still exactly like them, but once we see some of the trophoblasts fusing together and sharing all their nuclei in one large cytoplasmic mass with one membrane around it, as soon as we see a syncytial trophoblast, these trophoblast cells are now called cytotrophoblasts. Okay. And they don't really digest away the uterine epithelium or connective tissue, they kind of ooze in between and spread them apart. So it's not that destructive. And when they get to maternal blood vessels, the spiral arteries, they'll do the same thing. They'll kind of separate junctions between the epithelia lining the vessels and kind of flow in up the, side, the inner surfaces of the blood vessels. So the maternal tissue is in direct contact with fetal tissue. Now the stratum functionalis, mostly fibroblast cells and, and some of the epithelial cells of the uterine glands, undergoes an inflammatory reaction. The fibroblast cells kind of swell up, um, and that's called the decidua basalis, if it's directly involved with the fetal tissue, the chorion villi. It's a little confusing, because we also have a stratum basalis, okay? Stratum basalis doesn't change. So it's what stays behind if a woman um, starts her period, that's menses, what the menses is, is the stratum functionalis, plus any bleeding blood from the spiral arteries. And when that separates, we're left with the base of the uterine glands, that just extend partially into the stratum basalis. And that epithelium of the glands, the stratum, the simple columnar epithelia, grows up and replaces what has been shed from the stratum functionalis. It's like, if you remember from uh, first semester AMP, if you have a burn, 
Um, you don't need a graft, but there's enough epithelial tissue from glands, sweat glands, and um, hair follicles, the base of hair follicles, to regrow. But if you're, through, you're deeper than that layer, then there's no epithelial tissue other than blood vessels, and that won't be enough to cover the surface of the, of the skin. So it's the uterine, uh, base of the uterine glands down in the stratum of the cells that provide that regrowth. Okay, and if there is a, um, there's two different types of abortion, basically. You can have a implantation. Down here is our stratum functionalis. It's going to become the decidua vasalis. So all maternal stratum functionalis, all maternal tissue is decidua, and all fetal tissue is, um, when we see it outside the embryo, all right, is the um, chorion. We're talking about the chorion villi and levi and so, those two. So here we have a syncytium, the syncytial trophoblast. Here is the cytotrophoblast. It hasn't yet not completely settled down beneath the surface of the uterus and it will then become a syncytial trophoblast, although cytotrophoblast cells remain. Okay, there's always some. Here's the inner cell mass that is already changing. So you're seeing a little pocket here. It's not very clear, but this layer right here would become the amnion. This layer here would be the epiblast, which is going to become the embryo. And this layer here is the, it says inner cell mass, but it would now become the hypoblast, which the whole thing is inner cell mass, but it's just starting to become amnion, epiblast, hypoblast, which becomes the yolk sac. It doesn't, other than the uh, gametes and some blood cells, it doesn't become part of the embryo, okay? All right, so now um, this is kind of a little difficult to understand at first. This would be the continuation of the uterine wall, all right? So if I bring down one of our pregnancies. That one. Big baby. Too far. This one works. Of course, you can't see it. Um, but, so what you're seeing here, we can't see the rest of the uterine wall. So what's happening is this embryo is all the way down below the surface of the uterine, the simple columnar epithelia. And as it grows, it bulges that whole surface to the opposite side of the uterus, okay? And eventually that space is almost eliminated. So what you're seeing in this model is basically stopping right there. So you're seeing the lumen, but you're not seeing the rest of the uterine wall, okay? So the image up there is basically stopping right there. And so you're not seeing the rest of the smooth, you don't see all the branches here, 
And so it's called the smooth chorion or chorion levy. So L-E-V-A-E or L-A-E-V-A-E. -E. So smooth chorion and chorionic villi. And the decidua just under the uterine epithelium is called the decidua capsularis, forming a capsule over the developing embryo. Okay. Um, this is the yolk sac. This is the amnion that will get compressed down here. This is extra embryonic tissue that I don't bother naming. All right, we don't have this model, but it is the clearest one to show um, when the membranes need to be ruptured for birth, which ones are, are ruptured. So here's the cervical canal. All of this pink that you see right here, this and this blush colored pink is um, decidua, okay? So, Here's the embryo, here's the amnion, and this reddish layer here is the um, chorion levy, and this would be the chorion villi, where we have the branches. And then this would be the decidua bacillus, this would be the decidua capsularis, and the rest of the uterine lining, its stratum functionalis is called the decidua parietalis. Now, if a woman's water doesn't, um, water's breaking, it always sounds weird, but it's the membranes rupturing and the water released. Um, if that doesn't happen, um, and the OBGYN decides to go ahead and rupture it to allow um, labor, hopefully, hopefully that will get labor started, sometimes um, they will tear and there will be a loss of water, but more importantly, they, there is a, goes more than 24 hours, that could be an increased chance of infection. So they usually want labor to start um, before that 24 hours. So the first one that would come in contact with the instrument that the doctor uses to tear this is um, the decidua capsularis, then the, the um, chorion levy, and then the amnion. Okay, once the baby is born, then the last stage of birth is the afterbirth. And at that time, we have what Minty's occurred, essentially. The decidua, which used to be the stratum functionalis name, separates from the stratum basalis. And so it's the placenta and both chorion and decidua and all of this decidua capsularis is um, lost from the uterus, okay? And at that time, it's as if Minty's is is um, you have the raw stratum basalis, and um, that needs to be repaired, okay? So we have this model over there. This is just a small segment of a mature um, placenta. So we have the amnion that we saw here, covering the umbilical cord, and coming onto the top of the placenta, what we call the fetal surface. And the red would be the umbilical, they're colored wrong here. Um, no, they're actually, they're not colored wrong, but they're not. The red would be the umbilical um, veins, but oh, they are colored wrong. Anyway, we have two umbilical <laughs> arteries, and they should be the purple. We have one umbilical vein, and that should be the red. So somebody got the names and got the oxygen content. So two umbilical arteries leaving the infant's pelvis go up to its umbilical cord to the placenta. Now they're still oxygenated to an extent because they're still the same blood that's going down the lower limbs to give oxygen to the lower limbs, but they're more oxygen, this contain, the blood contains more oxygen when it comes back um, via the umbilical vein. And that's an oxygenated vessel, okay? So we'll see when we do our blood vessels next unit. Again, chorionic villi, this would be the maternal blood from the arteries coming up through the um, uterine wall. And then down here would be the myometrium, and well, the lower part here would be stratum basalis. I'm not going to ask you to see where the stratum basalis and decidual basalis stop and start. But when we then separate it, this is the fetal surface. I showed some of this in the lecture. So the, that would be the top of the placenta that we saw here. And so if you touch that or touch this, that's some, the um, amnion. And then if we turn it over, we're seeing the deepest surface of the decidual basalis where it was attached to the stratum basalis. Okay, so this is where that separation occurred between stratum functionalis or the decidual basalis and the stratum basalis. And these 
little bumpy things are called cotyledons. Uh, that's just for free. Uh, but that's maternal tissue, and 